Welcome to this edition of the Big East Rewind. I'm Chuck Everson, your seven-foot host from Villanova University. And my partner, as always, is the great doctor, Sonny Sparrow, ladies and gentlemen. How are you, Sonny? I'm good, Chuck. It's been a minute since we had a show. I'm glad we got something Yeah, going. well, you know, you uh, you had our good friend, I have to shout him out right off the bat, our good, our good buddy and pal from Georgetown, uh, Gene Smith. Did an admirable job filling in for me with the Syracuse cheerleaders. And Len Berman would be happy I pronounced Syracuse the right way, Sonny. Well, this so, is the definition of big shoes to fill. When when a 6'2 guy's got to get some of one shoes, it's... Well, yeah, I, that's that's true. I mean, that goes without saying. I mean, 17s, you're not fitting in no, Sonny. I'll tell you that right now. Oh, you know? Unless you're going, unless you're going so, on the river, baby. Yeah, right. So listen, we're going to change gears today. We're going to change gears, Sonny. Normally, we're all about the Big East, hence the name, the Big East Rewind. But today, we're going to be all about the Big Five and Philadelphia basketball because we have the Temple Owls in the house today, Sonny. I'm very excited to talk with these guys. I know these guys for a while, and um, both guys were great players. Both guys were Hall of Famers in their, uh, at Temple and Big Five Hall of Famers. And both played for a, a number of years after graduating from Temple. So uh, I'm very excited to have these guys on the show. So without any further ado, let's kick this off, Sonny, okay? Absolutely. Our, our first guest is from Freehold, New Jersey. Um, he, is the, he is the number seven pick in the NBA draft by the Phoenix Suns in 1988. And as I said, he's a Hall of Famer. Uh, at Temple University and the Big Five, you know the power, the forward, the power forward for the Temple Hours Owls, Tim Perry. How are you, Tim? Oh, really good. How you been? I'm good, Tim. It's good to see you as always. We run into each other occasionally. It's always good to chat with you and uh, check in to see how you're doing, pal. Yeah, I know. The last time we ran into each other was at the, at the Villanova game. Everybody yeah. thinks I play for Villanova. They, they look at me like this. Is this the one <laughs> player? I'm like, no, not not Harley, not Harley. <laughs> That's not right. Harley. That's right. You did a good job of uh, of uh, beating us up a little bit. We'll get into that in a minute. But, I, you know, you did a good job of playing against us. That's for sure. Oh, yeah, you know? definitely. <laughs> and, his, and his partner for three years on that team, a Hall of Famer, um, and was the all-time leading three-point shooter at Temple for a long, long time. I'm not, I'm not sure if he still has that record. I think he might, but... Uh, he was one of the best three-point shooters to come out of Philadelphia. And he played a number of years overseas. And uh, Mike Rieswick is with us. Hey, Mike. Hey, how are you? Great. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Are you kidding? That's, uh, it's a pleasure. Thank you for joining us. I know, you know, appreciate you taking time out of your, out of your days uh, to join us, especially on an Eagles playoff uh, day. <laughs> so I appreciate that because as, as you, you guys may or may not know we're Eagle fans here too, even though I live in New York, which is a difficult thing at times to be a Philly fan when you're in New York. So yeah, I will tough. say that. So, all right. So without any further ado, let's get into this thing, guys. Where you got being in Jersey and Mike, you're from PA, right? So yeah. Tell Mike, were you first? How did you get? What was your path to get to Temple University? Who were you? Uh, I how did that work? Yeah. So. Um, I, I didn't play AAU, you know, I, I tell that to kids now and they, they look at me like, what? Yeah. What, 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 what else is there? So I, you know, I just, back then we just played, you know, you played, we went to basketball camps, um, right. uh, five-star basketball camp is one that's probably been mentioned on this show uh, plenty of times. So, uh, you know, I was, I think it was even before rankings and ratings, but I was pretty heavily recruited. Um, uh, you know, I, I had, you know, I had, 40 or 50 offers, uh, most of the big East and, um, up and down the East coast. And, uh, basically what I did is I narrowed it down to a workable number. Um, you know, like 10 schools, those head coaches came to my home, you know, gave me their pitch. I narrowed that from 10 to five. I took five, uh, official visits as you know, probably you did. And, and who did, Tim who and, did you go to, who'd you visit? So I, I visited, uh, Seton hall. I visited Providence. Boston College and West Virginia, uh, okay. so three three Big East schools and uh, two Atlantic Ten schools. So, um, yeah. So it honestly, I'll tell you the, the, the truth. It, it came down to um, um, 
I was at a temple practice and, and when, when recruits were in, they had to get their butt up at five in the morning, just like the players did. So there was no, I was gonna say, know, there, no yeah, special treatment, practices, <laughs> no special treatment for recruits. So we were in there at five. You know, I was in there at five. I was watching the team, uh, you know, watching the team practice and, um, coach stopped practice in the middle of everything. And he, he, he yelled at Eddie Coe because he did not shoot the ball when he was open. And I'm like, Oh man, I'm, I'm coming here. I, you know, he's, he's getting yelled at cause he didn't shoot the ball. So, you know, that was kind of it. Obviously, you know, it's it more about the coaching, but uh, just the style of play coaches, three guard offense. And, um, you know, I thought it, it would be a good fit for my game. How much did coach Cheney factor into your decision? I know you were close with him. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean it. It's uh, it was it was all about about coach and his uh, and his philosophy and the way he did things and you know the way he cared about his players and you could really you know you could really sense that from from an outsider you know even though uh, he uh, he got to know me I got to know him a little bit in the recruiting process uh, but you don't really know him through just the recruiting process but even through that you could really tell just how much he honestly cared and loved the guys that play for him. so it's uh, it's fun it's funny you say that like i didn't know him well but that was absolutely came through and, and i remember i had that was one of the schools that recruited me a little bit and then when they i had the opposite reaction i said what time do you practice they said six i said okay i'll call you <laughs> call you later right yeah. i was like i can't do that those were, those were legendary i mean that that they were legendary practices though i mean yeah. You guys, we couldn't believe it. When we heard that, we were like, what? Because yeah. we had, in preseason, we had 6 a.m. workouts. We had to be on the track, stretched, ready to run at 6 in the morning. And I said, there's no way that I could get up yeah. every day and practice. It was every day at 6 o'clock, Mike? Uh, well, actually, it was 5 a.m., okay? So oh. a lot of people think it was it was 6, but it was actually on the court, ready to go, tape, you know, at 5 a.m., uh, the assistant coaches would would usually come in and we we do individual stuff from five to five thirty or so, um, you know guards on one end, big guys on the other, right. and then yep. Coach Cheney would would walk in around you know five twenty five thirty, um, and then he would he would start you know his his stuff. So um, and it was you know it was October fifteenth, the traditional first day of right. practice. Uh, but yeah, it was every day Monday through Friday. But on on the on the weekends we got a little bit of break. We it was nine o'clock uh then once games started started happening you, you it was a little bit better because we weren't getting up to, to practice during on game day and you know and things like that travel days so uh but preseason it was a grind i bet it was i mean i what time did you have to like call it a night i mean what time you know you got school work too you know so i know you know we would get out obviously this didn't affect you guys we would get out just in time to have dinner you get to the dorm, all the craziness is going on because everybody has their stuff done, you know. So, I don't, what time would you guys go to bed to yeah. get up? You well, had to get Tim, up at what four o'clock to Tim go. Tim didn't go to bed most nights. He would just he would just <laughs> go right to practice, you know, from from hanging out. But no, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, dorms are crazy. It's hard to sleep. You just gotta you, you gotta find the rest somewhere. Um, wow. But you know, it it took it would take a couple of weeks to get used to, and then. And then you, you got into a, to a pattern a little bit. And, then, you know, honestly, uh, we preferred it. You know, every once in a while, coach would give us a, an option. And and we all chose the morning practice. Cause he, you know, we get it out of the way. You know, the other thing is, um, no matter how mad coach was uh, about how we're playing or, you know, what's going on, he had to let us out at 8 o'clock. You know, because that's, that's when the, we had to get to our classes. And then, you know, the P, we practiced in McGonagall Hall. The physical, the PE classes would come in to McGonagall Hall to, to have their classes. So, no matter what was going on, we knew we had to leave at at eight, as opposed to like on the weekends where sometimes it was like a marathon practice. You know, you you never know when it would stop. So, what about you, Tim? Tell us about how you how you came uh, to be at Temple University. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for me, the it was like a different kind of uh, thing. Though I um. Um, me growing up, I got cut in the ninth grade, and later on, I became a drummer. I was a drummer, so I was really as I wasn't really into basketball for a while. And so when I got when I got to like a senior year, like nobody who was in front of me ever played basketball in that kind of level, like Division One, you know. So I didn't know. 
So I just had to fill everything out. So by, by my senior year, when the year was over, I, I didn't have too many scholarships, only division two and division three schools. Sorry, I had division three schools and NAIA schools. So I said, you know what though? I think I'm really, I'm a little better than that. I think so. I was just having kind of like confidence in myself. And I didn't know anything about anything where I was going because I didn't have anybody in front of me. So um, so uh, during the summertime, I ended up playing for the AAU team. So I was different from Mike. I played for the Newark Boys and Girls uh, Boys and Girls AAU team. And once I played for them, I wasn't doing too much. I was averaging about four, to five or six points a game. And I was just doing black and little black and shots, played about 15, 20 minutes a game. And all the letters started coming. You know, all the letters started coming from, but when I played a free off from my high school team, I had like very little, I had very little letters and like all small schools. So me playing with good players, like I played with a guy named Dave Rivers, um, yeah. one of your guys, Kenny Wilson, my teammate, Kenny Wilson. Yep. Yep. And uh, Woody Glass. So, um, so when I, I played with those guys, I was like, wow, you know, those guys are going different places and I, I, I didn't have any letters at all yet. So, um. That had to be some team, man. I know because you jumped pretty high. You know, I, you know, you were in the dunk contest for you know three times, right? And oh, then, oh, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so and Willie jumps out of the gym and oh, Dave. Willie, oh, Willie was a great athlete. I was like, wow, you know. Yeah, and then you got Dave and Kenny, are two really, really good guards. Really good point guards. Yeah, definitely, definitely. It's funny because uh, we played against a lot of competition. And I felt at the time that the game was too fast for me, you know, come from, I'm from Freehold, a small town. So yep. I never I never played that kind of competition. And I was trying to figure it out all at one time. So um, I don't know why, somehow I started getting letters, you know, I was letting about five or six points a game. And like Seton Hall, I think the Seton Hall was the only one in, in the Big East ever uh, gave me a letter. I was looking at Boston University and I was looking at a Northeastern University and Temple came in at the last minute. And so, uh, my, uh, my mom and dad, uh, Coach Cheney and uh, um, uh, Coach Maloney came to the house, and that was it. They, my mom loved Coach Cheney, loved uh, loved uh, Coach Maloney, and that was it, though. You know. So when when you ask them and they tell you this this routine, this early routine, what was your what was your reaction? You were you were all in, or were you like, I'm not sure. Uh you know what? Though? You know, for example, I have, I have two brothers. I have two brothers in my family. My brothers are like they're both them angels. They're angels. So with me, I'm I'm okay though, you know. But I kind of like flirt skirt a little bit. And my mom was like, "Listen, Tim's going with Coach Cheney." My father said the same thing that they wanted somebody to watch me when when I wasn't when I wasn't um when I wasn't home though. They they you know they never like trust the world though. You know they're just like really overprotective, and uh, they love Coach Cheney. And Coach Cheney was like, "Uh, when he goes to my college." Tim will never go out to party. We got all the guys are all in early, you know, they get their books and stuff like that. You know, mom and dad love yeah. that though. So that, that was you sense? I've been down there on that campus, Tim. There's plenty to do down there at There's night. Plenty to do. They don't have a clue though. Coach is just <laughs> who the selling spill. <laughs> he was the selling soul on that one though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Could you tell that he had this relationship with his players? Could you tell that early on? I can tell. I can tell. Yeah, I can tell. It's funny because coaches like that. Like, Give me a kiss on my neck. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, but he was such a genuine guy, though, you know. He might have been I, Italian. He might have been a little it. Italian. Yeah, he he, he kind of sounds like Coach Mass, you know. I, I, I love yeah. it. I love it. It's funny, though. I'll tell everybody a funny story. <clears throat> I said, probably, um, I'm not a crier. I never cry in my life. I never really cry. I, I hurt in my life deep inside, but I never really cry, though. I said, the last time I cried was um, we played at LSU and, um, we lost the game, and I couldn't get it go I couldn't get it going, and none of us couldn't get it going that day. We know we're the better team, but we couldn't get it going. And at the end of the game, Coach Haney said, "Tim, I love you," and they'll give me a hug. And I just I just lost it, you know. You yeah. know, I just I just, I just start crying. That's a special. That's a and special everybody, moment. everybody look at me because I, what I do with myself, I never show emotion. You know, you never know what I'm thinking of. I don't show no kind of emotion. And I just lost it though. They look, whoa. Because normally it's Nate Blackwell and coach always crying in the corner. Every five games, they crying in the right. Am I right, Mike? Every yeah. five games, they're crying in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at I'm looking up like this, you know. But that, yeah, that, particular, that particular game was me though. Yeah, coach wow. definitely wore his heart on his sleeve. You know, like Tim said, I, I never really saw uh, an adult male 
um, you know, uh, you know, I, I grew up, you know, humble, humble background, um, and I never really saw an, an adult male uh, with so much emotion. And Coach would would, uh, you know, he would he would come to tears a, a lot, you know, for telling stories in practice and you know after games and um, certainly after the season uh, was over and and then at the the year end banquet. I mean, it didn't take much. Uh, for coach and that kind of kind of rubbed off on us I think a little bit mm -hmm. it is it did yeah I mean that sounds an awful an awful lot like uh, coach Massimino for sure and you know I'm sure while we're talking about coach you know I'm sure the the part the basketball part of the relationship was the smallest part right I know Mike you you were there with them to the end right you, you eulogized him for yeah his funeral, I correct? saw that I did yeah um I did and you know it you don't really, as a player, you know, you don't really realize how, you know, how quickly the time is going to go, uh, you know, with, with coach, but, um, you know, I was, I'm fortunate to, you know, kind of remain in the area and, and all the players that remain in the area continue to stay really, really close to coach. And it's really not until years later, decades later, even, for me anyway, that, you know, I was young and stupid, you know, 18, 19, 20, 21. Um, and it wasn't until, it wasn't until, like I said, decades later that I, you know, that I realized just exactly what he did for me and yeah. what he was doing for, for me. Um, you know, it wasn't really about the basketball, you know, coach will tell it, you know, the, the coach will tell anyone who wants to listen is his, his best, um, accomplishment in his entire career is when he was voted teacher of the year Pennsylvania teacher of the year when he was at Cheney State um you know he, he feel he felt that that was that was the, his best accomplishment and uh you know every, he was always asked you know are you regret not making the final four and, and he would just kind of chuckle I know he, he he would be professional he you know answer the question but the bottom line is for him it was just building building you know, young men into men and, and making, make, you know, giving them life lessons and, you know, sending them out to be, you know, productive citizens in society. Right, How right. about you, Tim? What, what, what are your thoughts uh, on coach? Uh, yeah. Uh, coach Cheney, um, I'll tell you one thing. It's funny because um, when I, when I first left temple, when I first, sorry, when I first got to temple, my father at home was so strict I'm like, man, I can finally relax and, and cut up a little bit. You know what I mean? I always wanted to cut up just a little bit, you know? Even though I was on campus, it was a structured, structured settlement, though. I wanted to cut up a little bit. And when I got to school, though, I was like, oh, he was the same kind of person, though. And uh, he, uh, I, ended up being, I ended up befriending a friend, and Coach was right on it, though. He's right on it. My friend, who was on the team for a little bit, Coach got rid of him really, really quick, though, because he know. He didn't want me going out anywhere close to him, though, you know. So uh, he got rid of him like really, really quick. And it's funny because yeah. um, uh, coach, we coach end up. He always trying to take care of people. Everybody, yeah, yeah. We have guys on the team or guys on other teams, whatever, whatever. And he, whatever, if you have like a rough background, he always trying to help you out and try to uh, do the best as possible. So one particular guy he had, I don't know him. I met him first day on campus. My team was my teammate though. So this guy was in. This guy was in a juvenile home, but I never know it though, you know. But yep. he and I, he was the first person I met. <clears throat> so we befriended each other. We was really, really close. And coach said, Tim, I don't want you hanging out with such and such. I don't want to give his name out, though. I don't want you hanging out with such and such. By that time, <clears throat> he was my best buddy on campus, though, you know? And I'm like, coach, I said, coach, I'm kind of grown now, you know what I mean? You can't tell me what to do. He said, all right, get out of my office. You can't, uh, dude, just get out of my office. And so, you know, what? the next day he was gone. I was like, wow, you know? Oh, but it was a blessing in the blessing in the skies though. Once he once he left though, yeah. Once he, yeah, but uh, he knew. Yeah. He he know. Yeah, he know. Yeah, Plus, well, he's just looking out. He's just looking out for you guys. I mean, like I said earlier, it it really reminds me, Coach Mass, especially what you said, Mike. You know, the the you know you realize years later you're coaching, you're talking to your kids, you're coaching kids, and I hear you know I hear his voice coming out of my mouth. Everything that he was telling us, I was telling the kids and sharing with my my family and, and and my kids and stuff and that's when i knew um that it was a special thing and you know it listen and the relationship morphed 
you know, from player coach to friends and confidants and he was a right. mentor and, and everything. And when he got sick, um, you know, we spent, an, we spent a really, uh, a lot of time together. So I, I know exactly, uh, what you're saying, Mike, and, it, and yeah. you listen, the two of us, you know, the three of us, uh, you know, have a relationship with our coach that, you know, goes way beyond basketball and, uh, and it is more about life than basketball. I learned much more about life than I did about basketball. And I learned a heck of a lot of basketball too, when we were playing for him, you know? 100%. So it's, and a lot of guys, when we're doing this show, you know, some of the guys, um, you know, different teams that uh, one team comes to mind is Georgetown didn't have that type of relationship with, with coach Thompson. Mm. You know, and I know, I know coach Cheney and coach Thompson were tight because uh, Thompson uh, inducted uh, coach Cheney in the hall of fame. And, um, you know, that was a pretty emotional uh, speech that Thompson gave, too. So yeah, it was, yeah. it's kind of, it's kind of, you know, there's two a couple of sides. And some guys show that side and other guys don't. And I give Coach Cheney credit for, you know, wearing his emotions on his sleeve, so to speak, when it came to you guys. It's really good to hear that because as an opponent of yours, you know, we had one vision of what the guy is. You know, and how tough, you know, and what stood out to me was the man's toughness. I know that, you know, he, he, one minute he's chasing guys around, you know, Calipari around in the, in the, in the, in the presser. And then, and the next thing you know, he's, he's kissing Tim Perry on the cheek, you know? That's right. That's so, right. yeah. you know, so it, it's, it's pretty cool actually. So yeah. did, did he ever like seriously consider a move to the NBA? Were you guys aware of that ever being on the table at all? No, I, you know, he, um, he came to Temple, he was 50 years old. Um, you know, he, he didn't really get a shot. He was extremely successful, obviously, at Cheney State. He won a national championship and, and then also a national runner-up as well. Uh, had some great players. And it wasn't until he was 50 that he got his, his chance to, you know, to go to the Division One level. So I, don't, I think, you know, I don't think it was, it was um, in his mind at all. Really, you know, honestly, co coach, coach is so so emotional. I know, at least for my four years, you know, I, obviously every year ended in a loss. Uh, you know, we did, unlike unlike you, Chuck. So, <laughs> um, yeah. you know, if you don't win at all, it, your year always ends in a loss if you make it to the tournament. And and coach was uh, ever after every after every year, he basically would say, "Man, I I'm I got to think about coming back next year." Oh, really? uh, he would he would always come back, you know. Uh, of course, um, you know, was there for for twenty two years or something. But um, no, he, I don't think I don't think the NBA was was ever in his mind. We I don't know if if he would even have uh, been able to to coach those guys because he's so he was so hands on back then um, that uh, you know it might not have translated well. How yeah. about moving up? How about moving up to like a more high profile program? No, I don't. I don't. I've never. I never heard of any rumors of anything like that. You know, he was he like was that's unheard temple. of nowadays. You know, what yeah, I mean? like yeah, that, he was, he was and temple. Him. Yeah, but he was a real Philly guy, right, Mike? I mean, you know, he he was embedded in that Philadelphia uh, community and everything. He was. You see him around and you know walking around town and stuff like that. So yeah, most amazing thing that I thought is coach coach lived in in the house that he he grew up. In, you know so oh, really? uh, even when he was a coach um Humble. yeah so he you know he's from south philly and he went to a bethune cookman for college um and then you know he was back and you know he would tell you know all kinds of crazy stories about you know playing with will chamberlain and bill bradley and going to the playground and you know dominating and then of course he was in the eastern pro league doing the same thing and um but yeah he yeah, it wasn't it wasn't hard to find him either in the you know in the off season. He's in the Italian market, or he's uh, <laughs> you know, uh, he's he, he was usually eating food somewhere, or buying food somewhere, or shopping right, for yeah. ties. <laughs> yeah, that's it. So so let's get into let's get into some Big Five talk, guys. So the the <laughs> Philadelphia Big Five, the city series, has been around for a long, long time. I think since like nineteen forty five or something. Um, and it, it's for people that don't know, it's, there was five teams. It was Temple, Villanova, Pennsylvania, St. Joe's and LaSalle. Now this year they went to a different format and they added Drexel into the mix. 
Drexel, baby, Drexel. <laughs> we'll get into that in a second. But talk about the, talk about what that was like playing at the cathedral, uh, Tim. At you know for at at the Palestra, we had those double headers on Saturday afternoons. I I, I part, and I've told Sonny this, and we've talked about it a little bit on the show. Is I love those double header games, those twelve and two games or twelve and two thirty games at the Palestra. Right, right. You no, know, it's funny though. Like I said before, though, um, I just got into basketball, so really I didn't know anything about the Big Five. So when I first got there, uh, I think one of the biggest, the first game I played, the first big game I played was against Villanova, I think. And man, I never played in front of a big crowd before, that big of a crowd. Yeah. So I was, I remember being in the tunnel with my teammates. I'm like, oh my god, and I'm starting too. I'm starting. Usually, what happens is, my freshman year, I would start. I would start the game, get get the jump ball. Coach said, "Go in and win the tap," and he would take me straight out. Boop. But sometimes, sometimes he would take me. He would keep me in, so I would never know if I'm going to stay in the game or, or come out right away. But man, when I saw the big crowd as a freshman, like man, I hope I don't mess up, you know. And I, I and that's funny because I was looking at uh, Ed Pickney, Dwayne McClain, all those guys, and, and the layup line. I'm like, whoa, you know. I'm like, this is like big time basketball. And I was like, I just hope I don't mess up. I just hope I don't mess up, you know, because I, I I had to start. And sometimes I never know how long coach going to keep me into the game, you know. But I thought it was it was like really uh, it was a phenomenal it was phenomenal being being in, in the University of Penn uh, campus. Um, uh, the pleasure I loved it though, the death, you know. Yeah. How about you, Mike? Yeah. Now, so uh, unlike Tim, I, I was I was aware of the Big Five, you know, being yeah. being my you know, how I was recruited and, and all, you know, all the big five teams, uh, maybe with the exception of Penn, uh, recruited me. Um, and I, I used to go down as a high Bring your school. Books up, Mike. Bring your books up. <laughs> I just did. <laughs> yeah. My, uh, my grades might not have been Penn worthy, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, the other four schools, okay. But my, um, my assistant coach in high school, uh, who, who was, wasn't really that, that much older than me, you know, uh, he, he was uh, probably just eight or nine years old, older than me. He was a young assistant coach. Um, and he used to, he used to take me and some high school teammates down to those double headers that you were talking about. Uh, right. And I was a, you know, I was a, a sophomore or junior in high school. And, uh, and I, 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 you could, when I say feel that environment, you, you, you literally felt it. Uh, you smelled it, you know, in the palestra, um, you know, this, this, the, the, the sound, um, you know, the, the, uh, the enthusiasm with the both sides and the streamers. Uh, so I kind of, you know, I kind of had a initiation with the big five, you know, when I was already in high school and, and I just, you know, I just remember thinking as a high school player, oh my God, it would be, it would be like the, the dream that one day play in that kind of environment. And, you know, I was fortunate enough to, to, to have that opportunity. The right. signs and the streamers were a pretty cool tradition. And some some of the signs were funny, and some of them sometimes could get a little hurtful to some of these guys. Thank you know, thank God I wasn't on the end of that. I mean, uh, that you know, especially uh, I also thank goodness that there's no there was no social media back in the day too. Yeah. We, can I can I just make an outsider comment from playing yeah. Villanova in the Palestra? Can you do something with the locker rooms there? Can can oh, you? It was a closet. Because you're yeah. you're sitting on a, a radiator, you're you're changing some guy's butts in your. I mean, it was <laughs> brutal. Yeah, you're gonna have you're to right. talk to Penn on that one. Right, you're right. <laughs> now, funny. I, you know, it's it's called the City Series, Sonny. But mm -hmm. Villanova was the only suburban team in the City Series, you know, and there was a club, very guys. there was a very big disdain and dislike for. Uh, our team. I felt that. I don't know well, if that's true from your end, guys, but I I know we didn't we didn't like playing you, but not because not because you were a city team or anything, but it's because you had a guy named Granger Hall on your team. We talked about that, Mike, before the show. But Granger Hall would destroy us. Have always have his best game against Ed, you yes. know, and and we couldn't stop him. We had a big problem uh, with that guy, and it was always it always came down to the end with uh, with Temple. Was there was there a was there a, a, a besides the the you know the St. Joe's of the of the series and everything was there a big dislike for the for our squad? Um, I think maybe a little bit more than 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 others because um, the other the other schools always tended 
at least when I was there, to have a, lo a local flavor on the team. Yeah. Um, you know, like just thinking back to to my time, yeah, eighty five through eighty nine, and and you know, thinking of the the Villanova roster, and there there wasn't too many local Philadelphia players uh, on right. that team. That's so polite. Um, this is such a <laughs> That was very polite. I'm laughing at myself, buddy. I'm dying. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, just I'm like, say okay, what you I mean. I know yeah. what it really is. Come yeah. on. But the, the thing is, is like a lot of people don't realize, like like uh, Gary Massey is, is a good friend of mine now. Yeah. Uh, yep. Doug West, I see Doug a, a lot. Doug's um, with the Sixers, yep. You know, and, and he was, you know, he's uh, now he's with the Sixers. He was doing some, you know, some work with a, a, a local high school. I would bump into him because I'm also, you know, an assistant at a high school level. So, uh, so I know a lot of these guys and it's, it's hard to have the disdain now years later, but, you know, yeah. definitely back then, you know, the, the competition was, was heated, um, you know, and I, I think because, you know, and the during that time out of the other, out of all the schools, it was, it was Temple Villanova, Villanova had just come off a national championship and, you know, you're obviously still very, very good. Uh, the other teams, you know, LaSalle was, had some really good teams. Uh, St. Joe's at the time uh, was also pretty good. But I think Villanova had probably the, you know, the, the best team out of the, uh, you know, out of that group. It, it wasn't like we didn't try to get Philly. Got You got Howie uh, Money Evans from us. We got <laughs> Veltra Dawson in that deal. That You got the better end of that deal. Rest in peace, Velt. He's, uh, but, you know, I mean, listen, he was real, real good. I mean, right. yeah, so Tim. To a lot of wins. Tell us, Tim. Did you hate Villanova like we like we didn't like Georgetown? Tell me. Come on. Uh, you know, you know what? I, I didn't. I didn't tell you the truth. I, I remember. Um, I remember. Um, uh, Nate Blackwell told me. He said he was in the airport one time, and he said, he said he looked at he looked at he looked at Villanova's team the year they won it, and Coach Cheney said, "Look at that team right there. You see that team right there? He stopped there. Only everybody on Temple team. He looked at the team. He said, look at the team over there.'" Is that team right there built to win the game, built to win the um, NCAA's? That's what he said, and they end up winning it. I remember because they told me that Coach Cheney had said that that particular year, and they end up winning. Uh, they said well, that's one of his Google things. He just knows stuff, you know. He said that team is built to win, win the whole thing. Tim, just yeah, so you smart know, smart guy. That's why I like way. Coach Cheney. Uh -huh. Tim, yeah. Just so you know, I got to do more shows with Chuck. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's bad enough he sits in front of like a shrine now i gotta hear like oh they would respect us and our coach told us that oh yeah 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 <laughs> yeah definitely 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 Listen, sonny you got your pound of flesh at the dome believe me man but, you know <laughs> we had a guy named pearl washington on your team that uh, didn't listen, you know? listen it's, it's funny though as far as pearl washington Pearl Washington was my most exciting player to watch in college, though. You know, no matter what, I would just try to find the TV, whatever, and watch Pearl. I love Pearl. That's funny. Yeah. I love to watch Pearl Washington. Pearl Washington, Walter <laughs> Berry, Walter Berry, and um, Ben Bias. Those were my, my favorite three back in the day. Yeah. Now, Pearl and David Rivers, we met at Notre Dame. That was a huge marquee NBC matchup game. I'll never right, forget right. it. That's sweet, sweet, it. sweet, yeah. sweet. Give us some of your best Big Five memories, guys. Games or or things that went on. Mike, I I hear you have a reputation as a master storyteller. So tell me a <laughs> couple of stories does. about Big he Five. Yes, he, he, he remember everything. I know, Mike. Come on now, let it go. Yeah. You know. Um, well, I I think the 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 obvious one, if you're especially if you're a Big Five fan, um, the one that sticks out the most was uh, Temple versus Villanova in in 1988. Yeah. Um, now it's funny because the uh, the the game was not at the Palestra, so just to you know to confuse those people that are not quite Big Five fans, there was a time when all games were played at the Palestra, and then right around that mid '80s time frame, there was a, a movement with uh, you know with with Coach Mass honestly to to have more games at home uh, and moved away from the Palestra. So there was a lot, a lot of the Big Five games were moved on campus, but. This particular game, um, Temple had just uh, become number one. I, I think we, it was our second game after becoming number one in the country in 1988, and uh, and Villanova I think was 20th in the country. Um, and this was this was before social media. Um, you know, if this was so, during social media time, that game would have been even that much more hype. But before social media, it was the only way you could get the info and, you know, it was newspapers and uh, newscasts, you know, the, 
the the game leading up to the game, I think there was three or four days before the game. I mean, it was you could feel the the tension uh, and the excitement for the for the game. Um, it was at McGonagall Hall, and they say McGonagall Hall held like forty five hundred. I think there was like eight thousand people there. There was, <laughs> there, there was people in the walkway. There was people on the track above, um, and you know. A lot of people say it's the best Big Five game ever. I mean, I don't. I leave that to the talking heads. But uh, the one thing I do know is uh, both teams were known for defense. Um, I mean, both teams I think were in the top ten defensively, um, and coaches were powerless. And I think the, the we ended up winning. It was like ninety eight, ninety five. You know, both teams shot like an incredibly high percentage. I think Doug West made the first five three pointers of the game. Uh, he had like 15 points in the first three minutes. Um, I think uh, Mark Macon had like 35. That was the famous Howie Evans game where he had 20 assists and no turnovers, um, wow. which is still, I think, a Temple record. But um, that that game by far, you know, sticks out for me, you know, just because of, of the circumstances, the, uh, you know, the hype. You know, I, I remember, you know, there was – at our practices, you know, every every news station was there at every practice. It was on all the time, you know, leading up to the game, and it was and the game did not disappoint. Tell us a little more about the '88 team. What what made that team special? Um, so a lot of people don't don't remember or realize the team that the year before the you know the '86 '87 team. Um, was was also very good uh so i was a sophomore tim was a junior um that was nate blackwell's senior year yep uh howie ramon ribas uh, we had a strong bench and that team actually climbed to number five in the country uh tim had mentioned the lsu game earlier uh that was the game we couldn't get it going i just want one thing i i i got i had it going that game but no one else did. <laughs> <laughs> i had like I had like 25 points, but that's beside the point. But uh, that that and and LSU bumped us off in the second round of the tournament. Um, so that that team, unfortunately, is a little bit forgotten. But um, like I said, we we had climbed to number five in the country, and the reason I say that is because uh, what made that '88 team so good is we the whole team was back except for Nate. Nate Nate is one of the best ever, and he's hard to replace. But we had a we had a, a veteran team come back. Um, all the four starters and, and our bench basically were all coming back. And then, by the way, you know, we plugged in a dynamic freshman named Mark Macon. Um, and who, Dwayne who, Coswell, too, right? Dwayne and, was yep, on that team. Yep. And uh, so we had, you know, we had two, two great freshmen. Um, and Mark kind of played off of us because we, you know, we just let him do, do his thing. Um, you know, he was just so athletic and he he could just kind of do everything he was a defensive stopper he got a lot of easy baskets uh while the the core four of us you know kind of knew where we were supposed to be and we worked to get him free and you know we just worked well as a team but i think it all it all kind of the foundation was laid the the, the prior year now mark did some coaching here at suny binghamton i think that's where he kind of got into it. and he was actually the he was the head coach when when uh after the brodus was here and uh he was really a shy guy, right? I mean that that's the, that's the take that I had publicly, and then when we, you know, we I would go to their practices. I knew like the entire coaching staff for years, and just seemed like he was just very like reserved. Is that that fair? Uh, you, you know what? Though, as far as Mark, though, he's not a loud person. Though you know, he would never be loud. Though, so I know him as a as a player and uh, as, as a person, and he's not a loud guy. I don't know what he says to his teammates because I was I wasn't there though. But as far as a uh, person, he's never allowed. He's my roommate. He was pretty quiet, you know. Yeah, yeah. And just get that that sense, you know. He was all yeah. business, right? He was like he was. Yeah, he was huh. definitely a business. Yep. Damn good. good. <laughs> yep, yep. It's funny because our personality uh, was a little different though. I'm a, I'm more of a jokester. I like to relax a lot. I like to joke around all the time. You know, if, it, if it's not basketball, basketball. I'm doing something. I'm joking around. And Mark was that kind of guy. You know. And yeah. it's funny because his freshman year, he come in, he's like this, he zoomed in, <clears throat> and I might, I might bring a couple of beers in and drink, drink my beer across the bed. He's looking at me like I'm crazy. I'm like, okay, got a beer. I got two beers in my hand. Okay, he's like, oh, 
he would just leave the room. I said, okay, okay. He just left the room. You know, I did I never let it, I never let it bother me though, you know what I mean? I was still myself though, but rock was always different though. <laughs> so talk about that run you guys made in eighty eight. I mean, you you were ranked for a little while. You were number one in the country, right? Well, you were the number one seed going into the tournament, correct? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So so you you know, talk about that run, uh getting, you know, into the tournament and and you know, where you wound up. I know you wound up running into Duke in the Elite Eight, which kind of snuffed you out, but you were real close to getting to the Final Four that year. Yeah, yeah, we we uh, we became number one like early February, and we stayed number one the rest of the year. So we were number one for about eight or nine weeks and number one going into the tournament. Um, uh, you, you know, just, you know, and we all know how March Madness is. Um, yeah. You know, we, we, uh, our first game in the tournament that year was was Lehigh, um, and Lehigh Lehigh. I mean they they gave us a, a it was a tremendously tough game for one versus sixteen. They had a guy named Darren Queenan, who's also a local you know local kid as well. Um, he I think he led the nation in scoring that year, um, and we you know we managed to get by them. And and the next the next game was Georgetown. Uh, it was one one versus eight. And then uh, you know we we beat Georgetown pretty good uh, actually. You know, that was right. was that the Reggie and the Miracles team? Was that that team where he had, it was? Uh... No, that was like uh, Perry McDonald. I think there was uh, 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 Gene Smith maybe. Um, some of the names. I mean they they were they were kind of really undersized, but it was a typical Georgetown. They're tough. Yep. You know, yep. tough as nails. Get up on you. Um, you know they they were you know, down for, for a Georgetown team. It was, they were the eighth seed. Um, they, it's funny, they, they, a couple of years before, uh, they, it was just the reverse where Temple was the eighth seed and they played Georgetown at number one seed in the tournament. I, I was before, I think, Tim, were you on that team? Yeah, yes, I was. And we yeah. got, uh, and <clears throat> it was the only game of my whole life. Normally before every game, I would go, uh, for every game, I get butterflies before every game. And I'll play against Pat Ewing for the first time. And I had butterflies all during the game. The butterflies never went away during the game, though. <laughs> Normally before the game, I get butterflies and they go away. That game, the butterflies lasted all during the game until the game was in, until the buzzer ended. <laughs> I know yeah. the feeling. Yeah. <laughs> you know the feeling, right? <laughs> so after we beat Georgetown, we uh, I, we played Richmond. So Richmond upset somebody. Syracuse. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I didn't want to say it, but. Uh, I'll say it. <laughs> yeah. I remember. Trust right. me. Yeah. So, uh, I didn't hear about the spiders. Hey, Sonny, for was, a couple was of Kenny months. was Kenny Atkinson on that team? He was. Yeah. Yeah. Kenny's a good dude, man. He's a Long Island yeah. guy. Yeah. Yeah. So we we played them in the third round. We beat them pretty good, as well. And then and then we ran into to Duke, who was you know it wasn't like they were some slouch. They were the number two seed. We were number one seed. Um, you know Danny Ferry and Gwen Schneider and. And and those guys, Billy King, Billy King, yeah, yeah. Um, so I mean, they obviously had some some players. It was a, a you know, the, it was a, I think a three point game at halftime. Um, you know, and then they just you know they they made some plays towards the end of the game. Uh, it just wasn't meant to be. Mm -hmm. And that, that game was at the Meadowlands, if I recall, right, Tim? It it was. This yeah. was yep, it was in the Meadowlands. Yeah. Yeah. Look at this. You, guys, you guys had to have a good crowd for that. I mean, Philly's not far from there. Oh, oh, we had we had a great crowd. We had a great yeah. crowd. It's funny at the end of the game, everybody was crying. You know, the parents, all the to the student body, the players, everybody cried. Coach, yeah. yeah, it was a sad wow. thing. It was sad. Yeah. It was very sad though, you know. You, you know, it, it. You know, listen. When to get to get to the final four, it, you're not. It doesn't always is the best team. You got to have luck. You got to have. The ball's got to bounce your way. A lot of stuff has to happen. Injuries, there's all kinds of stuff. So yeah. that's correct. So, yeah. so you mentioned we we talked about coach, all right. But now that I've got both of you here, okay, and both of you were involved with this, Mike, tell the story about coming back from UCLA. You had a layover in Chicago, and my good pal here, Tim, got stuck with Howie Evans. Missed the okay. and missed the flight because he was playing video yeah. games in the arcade. <laughs> yeah. Now, yeah. first of all, explain what an arcade is, Tim, because <laughs> nobody of of any uh, age now even knows what that is. Oh, the arcade room was a bunch of games. You got Pac Man, you got uh, yeah. Galaxy, you got a bunch of different games. You can play any game you want to. So you keep putting quarters in, 
and the better the better you are, the more you can, the longer you can play. That's all it is, though. <laughs> And that, and Howie and I, we got caught up in that. We were playing Pac Man or something like that. And um, yeah, it was one. It was a rough time. It was a bad day. It was a bad day for both of us. Bad day. Yeah, yeah. What happened, was, Mike? Yeah. So, uh, um, yeah, we had a layover, and uh, usually when you know we had a, it was a couple hour layover, and usually you know Tim and Howie would would make a beeline for the for the arcade, um, and uh, the, you know they must have lost track of time. And uh, the plane started boarding and, you know, the players and the managers, we were kind of milling around and, you know, coach could tell something was, something was wrong. You know, something, something was, something was not right. You know, he just, he could just feel it. Um, you know, we didn't have cell phones back then. So you couldn't, you couldn't call or text, uh, say, Hey, you know, wh where are you? Um, so, you know, coach, coach finally figured it out and he started, he, he started getting the people on the plane. Come on. Get on the plane. Everybody got on the plane. He was he was hoping to leave to leave him in Chicago to kind of you know make a point, um, you know, and, and to you know to just to kind of make sure it doesn't happen again. You know, it was funny. He was uh, he was rushing people on the plane. You know, he's telling the um, the the flight attendants to shut the door. You know, yelling up to the pilots. You know, back up. Let's go. Let's get this plane moving. Uh, <laughs> And that, yep. Lo and behold, they got left in Chicago. How late? How late were you to the plane, Tim? I, I, I'm gonna tell you one thing, though. I'll, I'll tell somebody: the worst thing you can see is the plane backing up. You know what I mean? How would I would when I face to the glass? <laughs> when I face, we don't forget. We're like both juniors. When I face to the glass, and the plane was backing up, we we're like, oh my god! Oh, so you were close to making it then. We were close to making it. It was too late, though. They said, "Once yeah, that plane back up, wasn't having that, man. Holy oh, cow! Yeah, yeah. So, what's okay, that so plane? Now, so now, what happens, Tim? I mean, I, I, you know, you're with Howie. You, you, what do you? So, there's no sports information director there with you to tell you what's going on, right? Uh, you, you know what, though, uh, Coach, I left a trainer named John DeSangre with us, uh, one of the managers. So okay. we end up, we end up, we end up hooking up with John. So we end up flying back to, uh, I think we flew back to UMass, to UMass. Yeah. So we get in the hotel. I said, uh, you know, Howie and I was talking in the front of the hotel. He said, listen, let's go in the back. Let's go in the back of the hotel because you don't want to watch past coach because you're going to be in the lobby. So we went to this little back door in the back. And guess who was in the back door? Coach Cheney waiting for us. <laughs> he knew what I read. He knew what I read. Because <laughs> he, always, he used to always call Howie a, a city slicker. He just knows what's going on. So Howie, like, convinced me to go in the back. Instead of going to the front of, front of the lobby, we went in the back. And for, you know what? It was um coaches sitting there waiting for us. It was so funny though. Oh, man. Look at it now. It was funny. That had to be the longest flight ever, Tim. Oh, it was. It definitely was. It was definitely. I was like, how did I mess up? How do you lose track of track of time? I couldn't believe it though. I couldn't believe it. Yeah. Huh? But Coach Cheney always say, listen, I love my mom in Georgia. I'll leave all any of you guys. He's always said that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great. That's great. So so now, so now you guys wind up going to the Elite Eight. Um, and, 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 you know, and that's it. So at the end of the year, we know who did you lose from that team? Was that your, was that your last year, Tim, at that point? Yeah, we lost, um, a uh, Howie, myself and, um, Ramon Vivas. Yeah. Yeah. It was three of us. Yep. Yeah. That's a big loss. And then what happened the following year, Mike, you just, uh, it wasn't um, wasn't close to the success you had that year, right? No, it it was it wasn't close. Success wise, it wasn't like up to Temple standards, so to speak. Uh, yeah. But look, looking back on that year, uh, we were eighteen and twelve, so it could you know could have been a lot worse, right? We we had a you know we played a killer schedule. Um, uh, you know, we we started out with like we played Arizona, we played Missouri, we played, um, you know, we we played uh, UNLV, we. We played Notre Dame, so it was a it was a killer schedule, and uh, you know, all things considered, eighteen and you know Temple was coming off like three straight thirty win seasons, right? Um, so eighteen and twelve sounds like a down year, but you know, kind of looking back, uh, we lost like almost all of our you know most of our scoring and most of our rebounding, and um, and we still you know we managed to get eighteen wins. Yeah. Um, and we were above like a quote unquote bubble team. Um, so, you know, I, I guess it, you know, it, it was successful in that regard. We, we, uh, we made it to the NIT that year, but, uh, we got bumped in the first round, you know, 
I don't, you know, I don't know when, when you, when you, when you used to playing in the, in the NCAA tournament, then you go to the NIT, you know, your focus might, you know, yeah, might a little, relax a little right? bit. So yeah. uh, we got, we got beat by Richmond, actually Richmond, they paired us up with Richmond, you know, cause they like to do that kind of stuff. So, mm. so Tim, t- now you get drafted number seven overall by the Phoenix Suns. All right, mm-hmm. that year, right? You you get you you lose in that game, and then you come out and you get drafted. Now, from a kid that didn't even play basketball until senior year, didn't even know how to play, had nobody in front of him, had really very few offers, as you just said, you know, to us. All of a sudden, now you're sitting there, getting getting ready to be drafted by the NBA. What what were you feeling at that point? That had to be unbelievable, going from where you were to where you now currently are. Yeah, it was a really good feeling. I, I, um, I think I think every year at Temple, I, I, pro- I progressed, and then um, um, I went to the senior, uh, it's a classic, some kind of classic in New Orlando, and I ended up be- getting MVP. And it's funny because uh, what really helped me out getting MVP was um, Rodney Blake was on my team, mm-hmm. and Rodney Blake ended up getting hurt, so I took his time. So uh, I ended up. Um, and I'm, I average, I think I averaged about twenty eight points a game in three games, and nobody never, nobody didn't know I could score. Even though I wasn't really scoring, I was just running the fast break. But uh, a lot of a lot of scouts didn't know I could run, you know, because at Temple, we uh, we walk the ball up, not walk the ball up. We take opportunities when it when it's when it's there though. Yeah. Really, yeah, we don't we don't run too much though. So that particular that particular tournament, I had a running gun uh, point guard. So you know, I just ran with him, you know, and I had centers with me playing against me. So I was a little faster than them, and I ended up getting a lot of a lot of slam dunks and a lot of uh, opportunity points, and that really propelled me though. And I ended up going, I ended up getting drafted by the Phoenix Suns. And uh, the funny part about it was, um, Cotton Simmons at the time was my coach at at that at that tournament in Orlando. There you go. Yep. Yep. You know so it all works out, right? Yeah. Now, yeah. You, yeah. You wound yeah. up playing behind Tom Chambers for a little while there, right? I did. I, I played good. I, I played under Tom Chambers and Eddie Johnson. You know, it, it's funny because I always tell people, you know, like um, everybody thinks about athleticism, and it's not though. You know, I remember I, I used to I used to gauge myself against Eddie Johnson because Eddie Johnson wasn't the most fast guy in the world. You know, I was like, yeah, you know, I wouldn't tell anybody. You know, I mean, it's keep to keep it to myself. We were we were the sprints. He'd be coming with the big guys. I'm like, yeah, you know, so I had to play him in college. I had to play him sometimes. And I'm like, man, this guy, you know, he's slow. And he'd be light me up in practice. Light me up. Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like, I, I, I was kind of frustrated half the time, you know? And Tom was like, Tom Chambers is hard to stop, you know? You think you're a, a, you think you're a defense stopper, but you're really not, though, you know what I mean? You can slow guys down sometimes, but that's well, you know? So it was like a rude awakening, though, you know? Rude awakening. Yeah. Was, yeah, was, was Tim what, Kempton on that team with you in Phoenix? No, he wasn't. And, no, he wasn't. It's one he, one quick story though. I remember um my first when I first got there, I saw a picture of, when I first got to Phoenix Suns office, I saw a picture of Larry Nance. And the yeah. picture of Larry Nance was like his head, he was so long and his head was above the rim. So um I I go to the workouts, the first workout before we even got practice, you know, in summertime there's summertime workout. And um I go for a layup. I could have dunked the ball, but it was Larry Nance cover covered me though. I just lay it up, miss it. And coach coach uh coach, coach Cotton calls cop timeout. He said, he said, Tim, I got you to dunk the ball. I got you to dunk the ball. I said, coach, that's Larry Nance, coach. That's Larry Nance. I was like, I saw the picture in the office, though, you know. <laughs> so I was always a little intimidated sometimes, though, you know, in the beginning. So now that you bring up dunking, okay, I have a question for you. Two of them, actually. Right. Keel O'Neal goes on some sports show and says he's only been dunked on by three guys. Mm-hmm. MJ, Derek Coleman, and Tim Perry. Right. Tell me about that when you when you caught Shaq on a dunk. Uh you know what though? Uh Shaq was a rookie and I don't know if he had, I don't I don't know if he can know I can dunk though. Really, uh to be honest with you, I had to probably dunk to almost almost all the big guys in the NBA. But I just I don't I don't show about, you know what I mean? Just not me. You know, I dunked on so I he goes up, he jumps, try to bump my dunk, I dunk on him, but I don't show about so it just go the game just goes on. I'm not a Mark Jackson. I was. I wouldn't ever shake it like this, though. You know. <laughs> I mean, plus, what I am. How'd that go? Do that again. How'd that shake up? All right. Okay. <laughs> so, so what I am, I'm really like. I'm not a small forward. I'm not a power forward. You know. I'm kind of yeah. in, in, in between. Kind of in between. Yeah. So so I used to dunk on a lot of guys, a lot of centers, a lot of power forwards, whatever, whatever. But I should never. I should never brag. I just do it and get get it out the way. 
Right. And coached, but um, Kevin Zanassi used to go, yeah. Ah! Said, Kevin, <laughs> go out. Stop doing that. Stop doing it. You're gonna be messed up. Because back in the day, they would hurt you though. You know what I mean? They would foul you really, really hard. <laughs> yeah. You know, I got I got fouled hard a couple of times in uh Detroit. And I started oh. shooting jump shots after that. After that. You know that? Bad boys, yeah. <laughs> They're bad boys, man. They're bad yeah. boys. Boy, oh, you got Land Beer. Land beer. You're not, not going down with you those inside. guys, man. Yo, I'm gonna tell you. I'm, I'm gonna tell you a quick story. Me, Dan Morley, uh, Cedric Tobias, and uh, who else? I forgot somebody else. We had a we had a dance called the Sun Dance, right? It's a Sun Dance with a hand clap, but we go slap each other all around, all around. And at the end of the dance, we kick, kick, kick we kick each other in the ass. You know what I mean? Pow, pow, you know, at the end of the dance. So um. This this the Philadelphia 76ers came to Phoenix Suns. We came, they came to visit us one time. And we beat the mess out of them. You know what I mean? So every time we sun dancing the whole time, boom, 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 kicking each other's ass. So um uh who else? Uh Charles Broccoli and Rick Mahorn. They did not forget that. They did not forget that. They did not forget that. We go visit the Phoenix, we go visit the, the 76ers, right? They beat the mess out of Kevin Johnson. He stopped driving. Now who do we have next? Jeff Hornacek, they beat him up a little bit too. He stopped driving. Nobody's driving. <laughs> Yo, so we don't open anymore. So they, they end up beating us, right? At the end of the dance, they get in the middle of the floor and do the they do the same dance, the sun dance, and oh. kick each other in the ass. It was so funny though. It was so funny. Because they remember <laughs> that. They remember that though. That was that was a funny thing though. <laughs> they remember yeah. that dance. Though. It was funny, yeah. Well, that's so, that's probably what that's probably why they traded Barkley for you, right? That was probably <laughs> That was the deal for you. <laughs> for the Sundance, yeah. right? <laughs> Too funny. Yeah. You, so now so now you get traded, right, as Sonny said, for Charles. And uh, they got Hornacek, you, and somebody else, right? So now you're back home. That had to be fun to come back to Philly, I would think, yeah, what right? What was that like, coming back to play for the Sixers, back home? Oh, uh, you know what? Though? It was really good. I was happy to be back. I was happy to be back. But we, we didn't have the same team, though. You know, out there in Arizona – uh, we were like 50 games, 50 games, yeah, 52 you, games. You had a squad, yeah. Yeah, it was great. When you're winning, it's a big difference, you know. It's a I, big I gotta difference. Ask, I got to ask you a question. Chuck, I'll ask you the same thing. It seems like Philly, there's a special bond that athletes have. C can you just take a couple seconds and just talk about, like, what it was like to play in Philly and then to be connected pretty much forever to, to Philadelphia? Oh yeah, one thing about Philly though, uh, they love they they love their players. Though. If you, if you work hard, put the hard hat on, they they don't really bother you though, you know. So it's kind of funny because I was kind of protected though, because um, I went through the uh, Sean Bradley area, and no, at the same time we were like transitioning though, you know. And the, the crowd was like really tough on us, but they were like they would give me a break though, you know. I had like a little break, so they're like such and such, boo, such and such, boo, Tim Perry, yay. So somehow I, I got I got kind of playing to the radar though, you know. <laughs> they always left me alone though. They all left me alone. You know, definitely did. But uh if you work hard though, whatever uh Philly fans really really expect you to respect you though. How about you, How about Mike? You, what Mike? was yeah. what was the attraction with Philly? I mean, what 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 was that connection there? Well, I, I grew up in the area. Um uh, so I'm a lifelong, you know, uh, area resident. Um, you know, a lot of I think a lot of uh, the outsiders and the people that are not from Philly, they just, you know, they see the headlines and, uh, you know, some of, you know, how hard, you know, they think Philly is, is hard on, and, and they are, but um, I think, you know, it's, it's the most knowledgeable and most passionate fan base. Um, and the one thing I point to, and, and I, you, you just um, you alluded to it. So there's so many professional athletes that did not grow up in this area that, come here, play in Philadelphia, and then they make their home in Philadelphia. So, um, I mean, I, I could name, you could probably name dozens and dozens. Yep. Uh, yep. Of, and that that tells you all you really need to know about what they truly think about, you know, th this area. Yeah. How about you, Chuck? You never said it. Uh, well, you know, you can get cheered one day and boot off the floor the next. Like, I had, <laughs> I had my best game against Patrick in my sophomore year. And everybody in the spectrum is cheering your name. And then the next game, I forget who we were playing. I think it was Seton Hall. Mm -hmm. And I went to dunk the ball. And the guy, whoever it was, hit me on the wrist. No call. The ball comes out and starts a fast break for the other team. And I got booed right off the floor. So I knew, <laughs> I knew all about it at that point, you know. So, I mean, but but listen, if you win in Philly, 
people still come up to us today, 40 years after that game. And, um, you know, I'm taking pictures with people on the street as I'm walking from the hotel to the restaurant or whatever. It's it's kind of neat, actually. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's kind of fun. So we're getting up against it, guys. Let's let's wrap with this. Give us one more uh, story about Coach Cheney or about your your time at Temple. Give us one. Give us one more good Coach Cheney story to end up on. Uh, what do you What do you got? You got something, Tim? Go ahead, Mike. You the man. Uh, no, you don't. Hey, Mike. Hey, Mike. Can you explain? Uh, um, for example, I, I know. I know. One time, for example, I always think. I always think we win every game. And one particular game, we were down. We were down nine points against Penn State, you know. And I think it was like a, a minute and thirty seconds ago, and I could have swore we were gonna lose. And I think I was a junior then, and we had, somehow Coach Haney called a timeout, and he told God to calm down, whatever, whatever, you know. And uh, we ended up winning the game, but that was one game I thought we were gonna lose. I had uh, that threw in the towel already. Remember, Mike? You remember that game, Mike? Yeah. They- you were right. We were down like nine at Penn State, uh, and actually they were on the foul line. And coach said, after he misses this foul shot, this is what we're going to do. Um, and then after that, this is what we're going to do. And then it almost worked out exactly as he said in, in, the, in that timeout. They missed the foul shot, um, came down, we hit a three. Um, you know, we fouled them again. They missed again, came down. Nate Blackwell, I think, hit another three. I. I I made a three to tie the game with like two seconds left, and then we we won in overtime. But it was just eerie how coach uh, in the timeout he almost um, he almost had like a crystal ball and, and said, "Here's what's going to happen, and here's how we're going to win." Uh, that I think to my to this day that was um, you know that was the best you know the best comeback win that I've ever been involved in. But you yeah, know, me too, me too, me too. There's at, a, the, at, the, at the same time, Mike, don't forget he called a timeout one time. Just to listen to the crowd, remember that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, and, and he just he he told us to kind of just you know yeah, take it in because it was it was silent. You know, at at the, at that time after we stunned him. But uh, you know, coach 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 that uh, he had multiple ways to do things. You know, um, negative reinforcement, positive reinforcement, humor, um, life stories. Uh, but I think his best his best means of coaching. He you know he would he would tie in life stories with, with humor, um, you know, and, and he would, you know, he would challenge guys, you know, what, are, what exactly are they made of? And I know one time, um, you know, it was, it was, uh, it was me and, uh, and Nate and Howie um, were the subject of, of one of his morning lectures. We had just played a game and um, I don't even know, honestly, if we won or lost because coach, coach didn't, the outcome, sometimes didn't matter. It's just how, how we played. Even if you, if you win, if we won the game, and we had 15 turnovers. It just, it wasn't acceptable, you know? So, um, you know, the next day in practice, he, he had lined the three of us up against the wall and, uh, you know, he was, you know, yelling, screaming, and then he told us to turn around. <laughs> uh, he told us to turn around. Coach got on his knees and he started, he started yelling into our butts. You know, because he's like, that's where our brains must be. So, uh, you know, it's just, and, and the, 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 you know, the team is is behind us laughing, and um, you know, he went down the line one by one, yelling into our butts, and he would go into the Nate, me, Howie, and he's like, this must be where your brains are, because I, I don't know how else to get through to you guys. So, oh, there's know, a visual for you. <laughs> I know. You know, he he had. Uh, he had a way with, with, with doing things, you know, he had a way with doing things. You know, I, I know that there's, you know, there's so many stories that, that can be told, but, um, yes. you know, there's another time when, uh, uh, you know, coach call a timeout, you know, he would draw off, draw off a play and then, uh, the team would go out back on the court and he would, he would hold Nate behind and he would be like, don't give the ball to Ramon. You know, just because he didn't want to, he didn't want to uh, like embarrass Ramon, but um, you, you know, so it's just, you know, just a very, very unique way to coach. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, you know, you're right, and you guys, I hope you guys both realize how fortunate you really are to play for somebody like that that actually cared about you as a person, and not just a basketball player, and not just 
you know, one of five guys that was running up and down the floor for him. I mean, you know, um, you know, he was more of a life coach than he was a basketball coach. Absolutely. He was a teacher more yeah. than anything else. And and that's, you know, very special. You might not realize, you might think that that's normal for everybody, but I could tell you, um, oh, yeah. talking Definitely. to a lot of the guys that we've talked to, it, it's not that way at a lot of places, you know, for sure. So. Yeah, yeah, that, that was the, well, at the, one, at, at the same time, um, coach, coach was little, he was a little touch, you know, that he was a little touch. That's what he would do every year. Oh. One time a year. Based on the last story, I would say you're right. Yeah, I'm gonna tell you though. I'm gonna tell you though. At once, it's one time a year. Every this is what he would do. He would bounce the ball. The, he would come. Into, we would walk into the gym, and he's sweating already. He's mad. We'd be sweating already. He would bounce the ball in the gym. Sorry, bounce the ball on the, on the floor, and he would punch the ball in the stands. Boom. He would bounce the ball, punch the ball in the stands. That means like, oh my, we're like this. Oh, he's he's uh he's okay. He's on that tip again. He's on that tip. So he like, he will line, he will line us all up, up against the wall, and he would want to fight one of us. You know what I mean? <laughs> just joking around. He want to fight one of us. You guys just keep your scholarship. Step across that line. Step across the line. You keep your scholarship. It was it was be the funniest though. He'd be like, come on, coach, come on, really, come in. Can we just start practice? He'd be stretched with sweat on him, and he want to fight one of us. It would be funny though. We'd be laughing though. We'd be laughing. Well, like I said, I appre we appreciate you guys sharing your night with us, coming out and. uh and hanging with us for a little bit and talking about uh, the big five and temple and coach Cheney. We really appreciate you guys. Uh, you yeah, know, thanks guys. So thanks yeah. so much for, for Honestly, having thank you guys, thanks thank for having us. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. You've yeah. been listening to the big East rewind with Chuck Everson and Sonny Spera. The big East rewind is produced and directed by Nick Chico chorus and Daryl Gurney. You can check us out on all things, social media by putting big East rewind in the search bar. And coming up real soon, be on the lookout for our new website that should be uh, launching probably in a week or two. And uh, we'll have we'll have more details on that as it comes out. And we ask you, whether it be on Spotify or the podcast or on YouTube, we ask that you like, subscribe, and share it with a friend. And don't forget to hit that, that bell uh, to be notified on future episodes as they come out. Thanks a lot for joining us, as always. Have a great night. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.